Let's give him a thunder of salvation. Thank you, worship team. They're going to they're gonna be back to lead us in a song that I feel will tie in what the Lord put on my heart today. I, I just have to um, share with you that in, in this season that we're in where he is just pouring out his spirit during worship, how difficult uh, it, it is for me to wrestle through whether or not I'm supposed to come up here and, and, and share the word. Um, John, you may remember the old thing people would say that isn't true is, wow, God really moved tonight. The preacher didn't preach. And, uh, you know, that, that, is, um, that is as false as it can get. Because if you read in Revelation chapter 5, you see an interesting uh, time of, of, of worship. And, uh, and then after that, um, there was a scroll that was being opened, and that's the Word of God. So it, it's not like, okay, worship is over, and now we're going to hear teaching and preaching. It, it's all worship. Because worship is simply an exchange of love. If we were to define and simplify what worship is, it is an exchange of love. We are loving God. He's loving back. And sometimes he speaks back to us uh, through prophetic words, through the new song, through the worship leader, um, through someone walking up to you and having a word. And, and many times uh, it's, it's through the, the preaching and the teaching of the word. Amen? Amen? So let's give the Lord one more shout and hand clap. Let me get into this. I really felt strongly during the week um, about, about what I was supposed to share. Uh, it must have been about 2007, about a year after we started the church. Uh, my son, now 26, was obviously much younger, and I was driving him home from soccer practice, and we were having a conversation while we were driving. I would turn and, and look at him and talk. And, and sometime during the conversation, he said, Dad, is there, uh, have you been eating licorice? I said, no, why? He goes, your fillings are, and he was like, you know, kids are just real honest. He's like, eee, you know, dad, gross, you know. He's going, your fillings are all black, you know, and I'm, I'm being polite. He just delivered it real right there, you know. And I said, oh, those are old fillings. I've had them for decades, you know, and, and with whatever material or metal they use, they, they're oxidized and they're very, very dark, which, by the way, is unhealthy for your body, they've discovered. Um, well, uh, within that time we were driving home, we were on 301 in Parish, and there's a Methodist church that had a big field, and uh, they let S.G. Jones, who is a uh, tent preacher, uh, set up there. And, um, he, uh, and, and there was this sign, old, old Time Revival Tent Meeting, and, and I just love the history, God's general, so I love everything that's coming out now that he's doing, and I just love to look back. And, and I'd not really been to one, at least one that was really authentic. So I said, I'm going to go. And uh, a couple of nights later, I, I, I went, and I was sitting there, and uh, the S.G. Jones, who we've become friends since then, just preached this powerful, powerful message. I mean, it was, it was a throwback in time. He was in the tent. His wife had the Hammond organ and, and the whole thing, all of those old, old songs. Yeah, you're, you're rocking. You're, you're feeling it, aren't you? And you're just rocking, man. And, and uh, he came out, and he actually wore the microphone with the apparatus around his neck that you put it in. Remember that? I mean, that, that, was, the, that was the hands-free back then. You had a, a mic with a cord with a little thing that went around your neck. You know those harmonica things? It's kind of like that. And he preached this powerful message. And uh, at the end, and it had been about the third or fourth night that they were having. It was the first night for me to attend. And uh, he said, we're going we're gonna to pray for miracles, but the first thing we're going to do is, is pray for teeth. And is there anybody here that has issues with their teeth? And later on I found out that's one of the manifestations that, that he is known for. Uh, so he asked people to come forward, and I, I immediately went up, and uh, there's probably about 20 of us, and we formed a line. And I'll re never forget this moment as he was just walking, he was just walking down to each one of us, and he would put his hand on the side of our face, and he would say, Touch! And he'd raise his voice, and that's all he'd say. And he's, he's a West Virginia boy, so it had a little bit of that twang to it, you know. And he said, touch! And then he would go to the next one. I just break them. Are we on? Did I lose it? Did I lose it? Check. Touch! Thank you. I think it's going 
and I think it's going in and out, so I don't know if uh, there's something wrong here, Mark. We'll, we'll keep, keep going. Touch! I don't want to ruin this microphone either. We'll give something Mark to do, for Mark to do around here, fix the, fix the cordless mic. And when he went to me, he did the same thing, and he just said that one word, went to the next person, and immediately my whole face turned numb is the only way I can describe it. And then he went down and he went down. And I hadn't spoken to him before the meeting. We, we didn't know each other yet. Hadn't obviously become friends, and then he went back up on the platform, and he pointed me out. He said, um, would you come up here? Did you have, and my mouth was closed. He didn't look in my mouth, anything like that. He goes, did you, had a word of knowledge, did you have um, oxidized fillings? And I said, yes. And then he looks out into the audience, and he goes, you, you boys from the newspaper out in Sarasota, you come up here with your own flashlights so you don't think I'm doing anything. So there's a picture of me that went into the newspaper that you can find on the internet with a news reporter with a flashlight pointing into my mouth. And he goes, what do you see? He said, I see bright, shining silver. That was the newspaper report. report. It, it was spectacular. So the, the meeting went on. I was very close to home. So I went home and I looked in the mirror and sure enough, I mean, they were just all gleaning, all bright, bright silver. And why would God do that? Um, well, one, he didn't want me to have unhealthy metal in my mouth. And two, he just loves to do signs and wonders and miracles. He loves to do it. He loves it. He just, he loves to do it. Our church was about a year and a half old at that time. And uh, we were meeting in a little hotel meeting room down by the river. And uh, I went to a pastor's meeting because I was, you know, trying to build relationships. And when I when I walked in, there was a couple of brothers that uh, I, was, I was being teased somewhat, mocked, to be honest with you. And, and I remember that moment and um, how it made me felt at my own. I was the new kid on the block as far as pastors go. And, and how that of offended me and, and made me feel bad. And uh, I've, I've forgiven. I'm not carrying any unforgiveness or bitterness. But I, I, I still think about that time and how today even in the church of Jesus Christ, we mock the miraculous. And I have a difficulty with that. Uh, it could be out of fear. It could be out of poor teaching. Um, it could be out of, well, not, just not willing to pay the price to be able to walk in that kind of power. I got to know Brother Jones pretty well, and he comes into town just about every year, and we will usually grab a meal. He's had me speak at one of his meetings, and he was telling me a story where he was in a Muslim country, and it's in this fairly small village, and it was quite isolated and quite poor, and he was in this meeting room that, you know, probably sat two or three hundred and he said the number one plague in this place for whatever reason was oral decay. And he said it was so bad among the majority of the population that the room smelled of rotting teeth. <clears throat> so he prayed and he did this massive prayer for teeth. And literally whole teeth, uh, whole sets of teeth were replaced. Wow. And then when he said... Jesus is the one that fixed your teeth, not Muhammad, not Allah, but Jesus. Who, who wants him as Savior? And now probably many of them with pain and the stench and all of these things, they all came forward and received Christ Amen. because they got new teeth. So anyway, they all received Christ because Jesus gave them new teeth. So they all received Christ, Muslims, because many of them, large number, received new teeth because of Jesus. He prayed in Jesus' name. Somebody yell out Jesus. Jesus. 
There is a spirit of mocking that the Lord spoke to me about this week that we are going to tear down. Amen. And we, we cannot allow it to come into the church. It's already here, not in our church. I'm not saying that, but the church. There's a spirit of mocking in the nation at a level that, that I've never seen. I, I mean, I, I don't want to get into s- specifics, but it, it's hard to watch the news now and, and somebody on the other side of the aisle, it's, it's a mocking. It's not even dealing with facts many times. It's, we call them memes and all of these things. And, and, and I think it's important for us to remember that every person that's breathing this air deserves to be honored at some level because they're all fashioned in the divine image of God. And that's hard because there's this, this pressure to join in to the joking that's inappropriate. Last Sunday, we had just such a beautiful service in the morning, and Miss Maggie did such a great job. And and by the way, um, we we really asked you to give sacrificially, and I, I believe, I haven't gone back and checked records over the years, but I'm pretty sure that if it was one of the largest love second offerings we've taken on a Sunday. It was over $2,500 um, that we were able to give uh, to the ministry. So thank you for your, your, your generous giving. Jesus was mocked so badly that they put a crown of thorns on his head and bowed and made fun of him and, and wrapped his head with, with rods. Miracles, signs, and wonders are so desperately needed for the world today. People do not want to just hear about him. They want to encounter him. They want to experience him. And sometimes when a miracle healing happens to an unbeliever that already feels bad enough about his life and doesn't think God exists or at the least doesn't think God loves him if he does exist, and suddenly one of us goes out into the community or anywhere in the world where we have risk-taking believers and prays for someone, then they miraculously get healed. Not only does it benefit them for that moment and that illness or sickness or whatever that might be, deliverance, but it also demonstrates the touch of God's love. And as I reflect back even now of S.G. Jones saying, touch, what was the touch that healed my teeth? Not his hand, but God's power coming through his hand. And when God releases his power, that's a demonstration truly of him releasing his love. Because his love is power, because God is love. Amen? This is a big deal. Last Sunday night, we ended up having... But let me go back to Sunday during the day. We had several credible people, uh, Mark included, who has been with us now since, I believe, 2008, experience uh, the fragrance of heaven coming into the room. Now, let me just say, God is always here where two or more are gathered in his name. He's omnipresent. He is everywhere. But there are these times and these moments, and it seems to be happening more frequent, not just here, but for those that are willing to take risk and believe and press in, that he's beginning to break through in this manifest presence with signs and wonders. How do you know it's a wonder? Well, it makes you wonder. It's just, (laughs) you can laugh here. (laughs) You don't have to take out your notepad. What's a wonder? Well, it makes you wonder. How in the world is a fragrance? And and for some, they described it was such a beautiful smell, and I've never smelt anything like it in my life. How many of you have experienced the fragrance of heaven coming into maybe your room or, or you have? Okay. That's just a beautiful thing. I mean, there's incense burning. That one, it's, it's that world breaking through into this one that actually touches our senses, our sight. People have visions. They see angels and so on. We hear people more people singing sometimes. That's happened to me as a young youth pastor in my office alone. I was just singing one or two words over and over. God had given me a new song. I had the lights off of my office, and as clearly as I'm speaking to you, I heard this beautiful high-pitched voice start to sing with me. I heard it audibly, and I know it was an angel that was just joining in. And in that moment in my office, heaven and earth became one to where that thin membrane was no longer there. Is this making sense? You're quiet. 
but that's okay. We're, you got your listening. You got your listening gear on. I have, I have been on a quest for over 35 years for heaven to invade earth in my life. And I'm, I'm, I'm loving every minute of it, and there's so much more, and I feel like every time I experience it, I'm still just getting started. I want my shadow to heal people, don't you? But it's not my shadow, it's Christ in me. So we're gonna talk a little bit about miracles, signs, and wonders, and then uh, make sure that I don't forget to deal with the mocking spirit, because we're, we're gonna bind and loose that. You know what, let's just start out right. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I cast out over our lives, over this ministry, over this community, our state, our nation, and the earth, the spirit of mocking that would mock the miraculous, that would mock the move of God, that would mock healing, signs, and wonders, and that mocking spirit that would cause the believer to feel uncomfortable, to feel shame, to feel out of place, thinking they're the weird Pentecostal on the other side of the tracks because they believe and embrace these things and tell the stories of when they happen. I cast you out in the name of Jesus. I break you out in the name of Jesus. And I declare you powerless in the name of Jesus. And may it begin in us, begin in the church, and then advance throughout the earth where the mocking of political opponents, of business rivals would stop. And the language of love would be the native tongue for us all. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. Would you give the Lord a thunderous hand clap to kind of seal that? I like to say thunderous. So tonight's lesson or teaching or whatever we want to call it is <clears throat> we are not drunk. So that's the title of the message. Everybody say we are not drunk. <laughs> but we're high on the most high. That's not part of the title. I just thought I'd throw it in. I'm glad you jumped in on that. So let me set the stage, if you will, before we go into uh, putting just one short scripture up on on the screen, so we see the day of Pentecost comes in Acts chapter 2, and it is absolutely stunning. It's amazing. They're in the upper room, 120 of them. They've been pressing in. They've been praying. They've been believing and waiting for the promise. And then a mighty, somebody say mighty, a mighty rushing wind, gale force wind just begins to blow, and it is a sound that thousands of people can hear, and they come running towards the sound, the sound of heaven, the sound of the Father in each person's garden is now being heard. And they hear their own language being spoken by people that don't know their own language. And the Bible says in verse 11 of chapter 2, and they all heard them speaking in their own language the wonderful works of God. Everybody say, the wonderful works of God. Say that two more times real loud. The wonderful works of God the wonderful works of God. Sunday evening, we had two people during com a communion, I think it was, one looked up and saw a feather high up by the ceiling, just, just spinning and floating, and she elbowed her, her friend, said, do you see what I see? And I think I see a putty cat. And so they <laughs> said they saw, the, they saw the feather together, and then they just saw it just vanish. Well, why, what's with the feathers, Dave? <laughs> And then Psalm 91 talks about feathers. What's the purpose of that? I mean, what, is, what good is that? Doing? I, don't, I got a box of them in my office over the years that have manifested. I, I just, I kept them. What's the purpose for that? I mean, he's, I'm not going to get enough and then, you know, tape them onto my arms and get on the roof of the church and try to fly. That's not going <laughs> to, that's not going to be the goal. Don't paint that. <laughs> You know, I think we miss something in the relationship with the Father. I think He likes to play. Amen. I think if He tells us to be as little children so we can see the kingdom of God, He must be a Father that also likes to get on His knees and play cars and pretend. You know what I'm saying. Have fun with His children. He likes us to enjoy his presence to such a degree that while we're worshiping, we see feathers, we smell the fragrance. 
difficult, whatever it may be. He just enjoys us enjoying him. Amen. He likes to unwrap presents early before Christmas. Amen. Amen. He's, a, he's a good, good daddy. He's a fun, fun father. Yeah. He really is. And I think sometimes we miss this, and we're always trying to find this theological, well, well, well you know, okay, i gotta have a, I got to have a three-point message here on feathers for it to make sense. The Bible doesn't say believe with your mind. It says believe with your heart. Amen? Amen. So we've got to have a feather theology now. We're going to have feather conferences. And that's where it becomes marketing and prostituting the move of God and the revival because then it becomes about something instead of someone. And then we compare last week's service or move to, well, I hope that happens again, and then we feel it, it was different and wasn't the way I liked it as much as then we think God wasn't moving when he was moving completely differently. He's never not moving. We just have to perceive it. We have to see it. And sometimes he moves just as sitting still as Dave has reminded us. And sometimes it's, it's running around and sometimes it's the flag and the dancing and the jumping. And I love it all as long as it's all him. Amen? So they're speaking in other tongues, and verse 11, they hear them speaking their own language, the wonderful works of God. But then it says in verse, you can put it up now, chapter 2, verse 13, others mocking said, they are full of new wine. Well, they were right, but that new wine was not an alcoholic beverage. It was the river of the Holy Spirit. But the point is, there were people that were experiencing the miraculous in thousands. And still, in the midst of that reality, in the midst of that undeniable reality that this is miraculous, in the midst of that, there still will be some, boggles my mind, there still will be some that will mock. Lazarus was raised from the dead after four days. I won't get into why the four days is important, but it isn't. It's significant. I'll teach that another time. But there were people there that were so bent on hating Jesus and his ministry failing because they were insecure, they were threatened, and they were corrupt that after the meeting, after he raised him from the dead, rather, they had a meeting and saying, let's not only kill Jesus, let's kill the guy he just raised from the dead. That's how powerful the religious spirit can be. And part of its manifestation is a mocking spirit. Amen? But not here, not in kingdom life, not in your life, not in my life, because we're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ that is the power of salvation. Amen? Amen. The kingdom of God is not in word, but as in power. Paul said, I've not come to you with eloquent speech, but in the demonstration and the power of the Spirit, that your faith should not be in men, but in the power of God. I'm power for, I'm power phrasing, of course. <laughs> I go into evangelist mode. That's when you're allowed to make up new words. <laughs> and others mocked and said they are full of new wine. And of course, Peter goes into this beautiful sermon and and turns that thing around. So I'm, I'm, I'm close to being done. Purpose of signs and wonders. Number one, it confirms God is with you. How many of you been maybe aggressively responded to when you've shared Jesus? Well, prove it. How many of you have ever heard that come back? And, any, and just two of you? How many of you have ever heard you? Well, prove it. Well, you know, they have the right to ask that. We owe the world an encounter. Say, I owe the world an encounter. And we talk a lot about the price you have to pay in the secret place and intimate time and all of those things. But it confirms that God is with you. John chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. 
because you have a nice degree on your wall. No, he didn't say that. He said, we know you're a teacher come from God. And I'm not against education or degrees, so please don't mishear me. But he said, but for no one can do these signs, everyone say signs, that you do unless God was with them. You have to understand, Nicodemus is one of the Pharisees. He's a leader. He's well-respected, but he's one of the good ones. But still because of peer pressure, the spirit of mocking, the spirit of corruption that is trying to influence him, he has to come to Jesus by the cover of night. But he's willing to put his... Re- he, if he would have been found out, that would have been really bad for him with the rest of the boys. But because of Jesus demonstrating. Somebody yell out, demonstrating. Because Jesus was not just talking about it. He wasn't just on the corners with his fancy clothes praying prayers that are going nowhere. He was touching heaven. And through him, he was releasing it on the earth. And people were getting saved, healed, delivered, and raised from the dead. And Nicodemus, a leader in the Pharisees, a leader of the law, comes by the cover of night, probably checking to see if anyone's going to find him meeting with Jesus. And he says, Surely, you're the real deal. Surely, you're the real deal because of the signs that you do. Bill Johnson says you don't need signs if you're comfortable going down familiar roads. Signs always point to a greater destination. So we need signs, and I love signs and wonders. I heard a preacher some time back, he said, I don't need God to show up and show off. I, I, and basically he was boasting on his knowledge and his maturity in the Lord. I think the best way to be mature in the Lord is to remain childlike. And I want to frolic with daddy every day of my life. <laughs> you good? Mark chapter 16, verse 20, Jesus is now ascended into heaven. It's the last chapter of Mark and close to the last verse. And it said, and they went out and preached everywhere. Where did they go? As you go, he said. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying of signs. Amen. Number one. It confirms God is with you. Number two, it gives God the glory. Listen, you don't even have to be saved to build a big TV ministry. Paul said, whether for right or wrong motives, Christ is preached, and for that I rejoice. And even the charlatans are bringing people to Christ, and Christ still uses them. I mean, he spoke through an ass in the Old Testament. How many people know the story? He's still doing it today. (laughs) Because the person on the other side of that TV screen needs him. And he's more interested in loving that person. He'll take care of the other one later. (laughs) I don't know about you... I'm shivering in my boots just thinking about doing it for false motives. That just, the thinking of that makes me quake a little bit. So it gives God the glory. So we set the stage again in Acts chapter 3. The man at the gate, beautiful, crippled from birth, is healed, and a big crowd comes around. And so when Peter saw it, verse 12, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this, or why do you look so intently at us? as though our own power or godliness, we made this man walk. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied the presence, in the, denied in the presence of Pilate. So they, it's an interesting, it's an interesting um, turn of events. Here's the man at the gate, beautiful, he's begging. There's an interesting thing. Jesus walked by him, by the way, when he walked the earth, but that wasn't, he left that assignment for Peter. So now later on, he's walking, and what does the man do? He reaches out for alms. He's been begging all his life. He's been crippled from birth, never used the muscles or tendons or anything in his body. He's probably like soft and like jello. And he reaches out, and, and Paul looks at him and says, Look at us. Silver or gold we do not have, but what we do have we give to you. In the name of Jesus, rise and walk. And immediately grabs him, lifts him up, and he starts jumping. 
See, they're, they're, we're, we're needed as the light of the world where Jesus comes through. L- look at us. Listen to me. Listen to, we need preachers. We need teachers. We need prophets. We need worship leaders. We just don't idolize them. But when they start looking at us in the wrong way where it becomes idolatry, we have to make sure we turn and say, why are you looking at me? It's almost like, you know, I, I, I keep going into this Brooklyn Italian mode. Peter's going, oh, look at me. And then he goes, oh, what are you looking at me for? Two minutes later. Because he did not want to steal the glory. So here's a man that everybody knew was crippled from birth. There's no denying that this is a miracle. But before Peter was able to receive that glory in the wrong way, he stopped it. And he said, it's Jesus that did it. Amen. Amen. It, gives God, it gives us the opportunity to give God glory. Tell another feather story that uh, some of you have heard, so bear with me. There was a... Uh, someone that I had been discipling, this is many years ago, about the things of the kingdom and kingdom now and all of those things that at, at that time were a little bit more controversial than they are now. It's more widely accepted because of the move of God that's happening on the earth. And uh, he started, you know, hearing some mocking voices, and it was discouraging him. And, and it was like all of the, the time that I'd been speaking into his life, it was becoming eroded right away. And, and maybe if you've been in leadership, you've experienced that. So we decided um, to go have a cup of coffee, and we were outside at a coffee house. And uh, I just began to talk. I didn't have anything new to say. I just started talking about on earth as it is in heaven and, and miracle signs and wonders. The things I'm talking to you that I've been talking for years. And when we were sitting together outside, he looked over to the side of my head. He said, Pastor, I just saw a feather materialize out of thin air. And I looked, and it was floating, and I put my hand out, and it went into my hand. And, you know, and lovingly, with a smile, I said, "Um, any more questions? (laughs) The the debate was over. I didn't need to have my mic muted. (laughs) And I gave God the glory. He just loves to do that. It proves you know, there's, there's, when I started preaching about the kingdom in the mid-'80s, I mean, people would even say, watch out for Kingdom Now guys, and I was a Kingdom Now guy. It's before I knew anything about Bill Johnson or Bethel or anything. I've been going after this a, a long, long time. But I just didn't care what people thought. I didn't care. I've never had the fear of men in this regard. I didn't care because I had angels sing. When I first got saved, I was heartbroken and in the most deepest despair right when I first got saved. And I don't have the time to go into all the detail, but, man, it was horrendous, horrendous grieving. I was in my mid-20s. I was crying. My Here I am, a karate champion, a world uh, contender, that type of thing, and I'm blubbering all night long because of what I, the brokenness that I was in. And there was just when I was trying to read the Psalms, I was only saved a few months, and, and I was just laying in my bed just bawling, and I just could not be free of this deep grief. And suddenly, I felt a hand on the top of my head just slowly stroke my head and the back of my neck, and it just came off me. And I know that was the tender hand of God saying, I'm here with you, son. But it was a physical, it was a physical touch. It wasn't, I didn't imagine this. I didn't see it in the Spirit, and all of those things are valid. But this was a manifestation of a physical touch, another sense, sight, smell, hearing the sound. I think there was a time you, we were singing uh, Break Every Chain, and you heard chains, you heard chains breaking. There's been times where we've been singing about the river and the water, and, and, and people have heard the rushing water. They see, he wants to touch our senses to, to remind us, I am here. Why? because he loves to confirm those things, but then he wants us to take the reality of who he is out there with great confidence when we face the mocking of the world. And we're not moved by that. All right. It gets people talking about Jesus. Jesus casts out a demon in Mark 1, verse 28 says, and immediately his fame spread throughout the region and around Galilee. I mean... Old S.G. Jones doing his tent meetings, he had the newspaper showing up because when he prays for people with teeth problems, teeth get fixed. There were people that left that meeting also that had their fillings turned into gold. 
And some of them, and I saw it myself, we looked at their molars where they had, you know, larger fillings, and there were angels and crosses etched into the gold after he prayed. That's a wonder. That's a sign. You know, it's so good. Uh, how many of you know who Randy Clark is, Global Awakening? His second-in-command, Tom Jones, and I go back to the, the, the mid-'80s when we were in the Church of God together doing youth camps, and um, he was telling me about uh, he was in Brazil, and, and they were teaching. They were doing their school of healing and teaching young adults how to pray for the sick, and they had so, so many people coming, and they had their, the teams that they trained, and they had this long line of people just coming by, be healed in Jesus' name, be healed in Jesus' name, and people just right and left miraculously getting healed. And this one, young, this one man, I'm not sure if he was young or old, but this one man had a, a glass eye, and he came for his eye to be replaced and get a new eye. So he put his hand over his eye and said, in the name of Jesus, I command this to be healed, and took his hand off, and he still had a glass eye with 20-20 vision. And he went, he went to the, an eye doctor, and the eye doctor did whatever the exam was, and all of the, the things that attached to a real eye grew and attached to the glass eye. Why, is, why not give him a real eye? Because if you go to an eye doctor with a real eye, he's going to go, hey, you got a real eye and you got good eyesight. But when he's able to take out his big pen and tap on it, <laughs> and you still have 20 20 vision, that's going to cause a doctor that may not believe to believe. You know, sometimes I feel like, and I don't know what's happening online right now, but sometimes I can feel the like, well, that's too much. God is too much because he's more than enough. I mean, Philip, I'm a big Star Trek fan. I want to know what it's like to beam up. <laughs> Have you ever been talking to somebody you really didn't want to talk to and you just want to go energize? <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Some meetings we're in, oh, energize. Philip experienced that before Gene Roddenberry wrote the first Star Trek. He was with the eunuch and was taken from one place to another. Read the book Heavenly Man. Happened to him several times. All right, let me finish up. Why don't we have the worship team make their way up here, and uh, we're going to just call us forward, and, and we're going to sing this last song. Lastly, show me that in the Bible. Here's my favorite. When something happens like feathers or whatever it might be, I'll, I'll hear, not from unbelievers, by the way, and not always from Christians, but sometimes supposed leaders and will, will show me that in the Bible. And my response to that is, what came first? First of all, before I say this next statement, I wholeheartedly believe in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. I love the book. Sometimes I hold it during worship. I kiss that. I, I kiss it. I just, I have this affection for the Word of God. So I want to qualify that before I say this. What came first, miracle signs and wonders or the Bible? I'm waiting for an answer. And they were recorded Where? They're recorded in the Bible. Jesus said, the things that I do, you will do, and even greater. Yes. And that is not only talking about the amount because there's more of us doing it. It's actually talking about greater miracles. People touched his garment, touched him, and they were healed. Peter walked by people, and they were healed. Every father wants his son to go to the next level. That's why he said we're going to go from glory to glory, 2 Corinthians 3.18. We go from glory to glory. And going from glory to glory is being more like Jesus than we were yesterday. In closing, John chapter 21, verse 25, I believe the last verse of the last chapter of the book of John. And there were also many other things that Jesus did which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. Paul heard things in the third heaven, which is the throne room, that were unlawful for him to talk about. But they were unlawful for him, perhaps, and I highlight the word perhaps, they were for a later generation. Because we're seeing things today in our nation. You just got back from D.C. We're seeing things today we've never seen before. Yep. That's right. Come on. 
So he told us to pray that world to come into this one. What world? The third heaven where Paul was. We're supposed to go from glory to glory. So perhaps things were reserved for such a time as this as we enter into the beginning of the third great awakening and the greatest revival of all. So say with me with a loud voice, in the name of Jesus, I renounce and rebuke the spirit of mocking and the spirit of doubt. And I receive the spirit of faith, risk and courage in the name of Jesus. And I vow to go into all the world and preach and demonstrate on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name. Everybody stand to your feet and give the Lord another hand clap. Why don't you make your way forward? Just fill the altar tonight. Come on, let's just fill the altar tonight. Would you do it? We ready, maestro?